Hello, uh, welcome to a discussion of Paul's second missionary journey and how this um, relates to obviously the New Testament and biblical interpretation, a lot of the archaeology that's here. Uh, Paul's second missionary journey is really uh, extensive, uh, so this presentation is uh, a bit longer than some of the others. You can see his route beginning in Jerusalem, moving up north to Antioch, back through his hometown, through the Cilician Gates, back to Derby, Lystra, Iconium, um, Antioch of Pisidia, whereas this one is Antioch of Syria, and then from there uh, up towards Bithynia, across we know to Troas, um, and from there um, probably he sets sail. We know he sets sail and sails to Neapolis, goes to Philippi, uh, Amphipolis, Thessalonica, Berea, probably sails then down to Athens. He's in Athens and in Corinth for quite a while. At the end of that, he sails across to Ephesus, um, down towards Miletus, and then back um, to Palestine, back to Caesarea. So this is his itinerary, much as I've just uh, explained it to you. Uh, so let's take a look at, uh, since we've talked a, a lot about uh, this region already, uh, we want to move our attention up here and then into uh, what we might say Europe. Uh, Paul receives the Macedonian call uh, and moves to Europe. Uh, Troas uh, is in the northwest part of Asia Minor or Turkey today. It's not far from the ancient city of Troy, and in fact that's where its name comes from. Uh, sometimes it's called Alexandria Troas. Um, it was a port here, um, uh, port to Neapolis. Uh, Paul's vision is here in uh, Acts 16. This is also important of uh, the we sections. This is where Luke joins in, most people believe, because the text changes to we, uh, as Paul's uh, his journey is being written about by by Luke. So evidently Luke, uh, most people speculate, is from Troas perhaps or from this region. At any rate, uh, Paul uh, is also here in Acts 20 where Eutychus falls, falls asleep while Paul's preaching, and we can look at these other biblical references as well. Well here is the area, here's Alexandria Troas, here's ancient Troy, here's Shanakale, uh, and uh, over this way Istanbul. So. Uh, most people who visit this area travel from Istanbul by bus down to here. This was the famous uh, battle of World War I, Battle of Gallipoli. From here you take a ferry across and visit uh, to Shinakale and go to the ancient site of Troy. But you can go over to the coast and then visit uh, Alexandria Troas, um, which is uh, a nice, and Assos, uh, which is a, a very nice uh, trip indeed if you can do it. The ruins of Alexandria Troas. Uh, I have uh, here's the, the harbor of Troas, where Paul departs, Troas, and he will sail across, uh, probably setting in here at Samothrace, and then he moves on to Neapolis, which is called Kavala today. This will now put him in Macedonia or uh, Europe. So the uh, Paul. Paul's journeys go here. Here's Neapolis where Paul lands. Still a uh, thriving fishing harbor and town. Um, here's another view of it. Uh, and from here he picks up the Ignatian Way or the Via Ignatia. And uh, you can see it here in different parts. From here he would have traveled all the way to Thessalonica which is called Thessaloniki today. Uh, when he gets uh, Near Neapolis, he is in at Philippi, and uh, there is a place that's called the Philippian Jail, where the St. Paul was held. Uh, there's also uh, the Forum here. This is probably where Paul was arrested um, and taken in and thrown into the jail. So there's plenty here to see. This is also the place uh, in an earlier time where uh, the Roman Civil War was taking place between the Republicans and the Caesareans and the uh, the Brutus and Cassius were uh, killed in a battle near the city of Philippi. Uh, here's some more structures in the Forum area. And then here is Amphipolis, the area of Amphipolis that he travels through. Amphipolis was the capital of Macedonia Prima. Uh, they 
along the Ignatian Way. Very much an uh, important urban center. Um, lots of archaeological finds here. In fact, some recent finds um, have been coming out of this area. It's not too far really from the capital of the ancient Macedonians, uh, Pella, where Alexander the Great and his father had lived. Here is uh, one that makes it into most books, uh, the, the Lion of Amphipolis, uh, dating to a burial mound um, back to the t Hellenistic times, because um, it's, it's a burial place of one of the generals and friend of Alexander the Great. Well, here's an aerial view of Thessaloniki, or Thessalonica, a modern city, uh, so very difficult when you have a big city like this to do any excavating because, obviously, it's, it's covered with uh, the modern city itself. But there is one important inscription that I would mention uh, that was found here. It's called the Polytarch Inscription. Acts 17, verse 6, you can, you can read that it's probably translated, or most translations, city official. Uh, this was a hapax legomena. This is the only place where this word polytarch appears. And in fact, many people uh, believe that polytarch was a misnomer, uh, some sort of error in the text. And, um, but um, in the 19th century, excavations near a city gate found an inscription and said that the gate uh, was erected uh, by order of the Polytarch. So it turns out that Luke, instead of being incorrect, was so correct that people thought he was incorrect. In other words, he used a very specific local, localized term for this. Uh, from there, uh, Paul will travel uh, probably by ship uh, to Athens. Here he speaks to the Areopagus. The Areopagus is really a uh, council of philosophers, a group um, of philosophers that would meet in the Agora. So um, today, Athens, of course, is the largest city of ancient Greece, of modern Greece. Um, so today you can go to a hill known as the Areopagus, uh, that or Mars Hill. Um, some people believe Paul may have spoken to them there. There is quite a bit of evidence, though, that he probably spoke to them because they would be meeting at this time more regularly in the marketplace, the Agora, in the center of the city. But uh, it's a wonderful place to, to visit, to see the city of Athens here. You can see the modern city, see the water there in the distance. The harbor of Piraeus is in the distance here. And, and here, the Paul um, probably landed here, certainly took off and landed here uh, at least once or twice. Um, here is the Agora. This is taken from Mars Hill, looking down on the Agora. This is a modern building funded by John D. Rockefeller, the stoa um, that he had reconstructed. But this whole area would have been the central area. This, this was actually a train station. Uh, John Rockefeller, uh, there were a lot of small houses here. He bought this whole thing, had the houses torn down. And uh, this is what led to excavation. So he really got the American School of Classical Studies here. So we know quite a bit about this. Uh, there's Socrates jail and temples and uh, Stoa. This would have been the heart of the city. Paul here came and spoke to them. And this is Mars Hill, or the Hill of Ares, or the Areopagus. So you can still climb up there. They now have a uh, staircase over here, because this is very slippery. You be very careful if you go up this way. They built a modern uh, staircase over here to help you get up there now. And from there, you do have a commanding view of both the Acropolis and the uh, marketplace. Now, whether Paul actually spoke up here or not is debated, uh, but this was the ancient place uh, of the Areopagus, meeting place of the Areopagus. From, from uh, Mars Hill, or the Areopagus, here's a view of the Acropolis. And Paul says, you know, I can see you're very religious. You have all kinds of temples. And certainly up here there are four temples at least. And he walks around. He says, I found a temple to an unknown god. So here's a view of the Areopagus from the Acropolis. The marketplace, the Agora, would be off to the right here. Uh, up on the Acropolis, uh, you have the Erechtheon, uh, a temple with the colonnaded ladies. A lot of scaffolding in this picture. And here is, the, of course, the Parthenon, 
named, uh, uh, this is all constructed in the 5th century BC. This is named for the, the goddess Athena, who, which the town Athens gets its name. And uh, the Parthenon comes from the Greek word Parthenos, which means a virgin. So this is the virgin goddess, the temple to her. Uh, the Propylon, or the uh, Sacred Way, takes you up. Uh, here you can see the temple, small temple to Athena Nike, and the uh, way that you enter up. There it is from the, another view. And a Parth Parthenon itself, uh, really a fascinating structure. Uh, built to, with exact uh, features and built so that it would appear to be perfect, even making uh, a bulge in the center of the column so they appear to be more straight. A lot of the things we could talk about there, but these these ruins certainly would have been there. I mean, there wouldn't have been ruins at the time that Paul was there. There would have been temples. There would have been great processions that would have been going up here every year. So here's the Parthenon close up. Here's the theater that's down below from the Roman period uh, near the Acropolis. Paul would have seen this as well. The Roman theaters were a part of every city. Uh, also, the ancient theater of Dionysus. This would have been an old theater that Paul certainly would have seen. It would have been a temple to Dionysus out here. He was the god of wine and revelry. And they would have had a contest for plays, dramas, comedies. That would have been taken place in his honor. He was thought to inspire uh, authors, musicians. In fact, uh, associated with him are the muses, seven muses, from which we get our word museum and uh, music and so forth. Um, the, the, Roman, uh, the, the Greeks did everything with a competition, and uh, the Romans continued some of that on. Here's a, a close-up of it. Here you can see the uh, what we might call the chief seats. You wonder what that looks like? Uh, well. They actually have backs on the seats, um, and a lot of times they would actually put their name on the seats. This seat was donated, reserved by a certain person, and that's where they would sit. Here's part of the staging, you can see, at the Theater of Dionysus and those so-called chief seats. Jesus talks about seeking the chief seats. Uh, Paul will then move south from Athens to Corinth. There is a narrow isthmus that connects the Peloponnesus to uh, the mainland. Near that isthmus is uh, Corinth. This is the uh, Diolkos, which is the uh, uh, stone paveway. Uh, part of the reason that Corinth was such an important city, uh, it was a harbor city. Um, uh, sailors did not want to travel all the way around the Peloponnesus because it was dangerous, it was longer, there were some treacherous waters. Uh, so since they have this narrow um, isthmus of just a few miles across, they would uh, start, uh, there would actually be two harbors associated with Corinth, one on the east and one on the west. They would put into one of these harbors, they would then sometimes uh, physically the the ship would be would be dragged along a, a uh, stone corridor um, pulled by uh, animals and so forth and moved from one side to the other. Other times the cargo could be moved, and the people could be moved. What this ended up meaning was that a lot of sailors would uh, be in Corinth for a few days while the ship was moved and uh, three or four days. So um, uh, this is what leads to, uh, of course, Corinth getting a reputation as being a town of sailors, a town of a lot of temporary residents. Here is that uh, Diolcus. And here you see the 1,500 feet of excavated uh, road paved. It was about four miles long, uh, varies in width from 11 to 12 feet. Cargo could be offloaded and dragged on carts here. Occasionally smaller vessels could actually be moved. Uh, this avoids the trip around the Peloponnesus. So I'll let you look uh, at these pictures at your leisure. Um, but I'll move on because we have several here to look at. Um, uh, the city of Corinth itself was destroyed in 146 uh, when it rebelled against the Romans. And they leveled everything in the town except for uh, the temple to Apollo. And it's rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 44. It was a big city probably 800,000 people in Paul's day. Famous for its immorality and for its commerce. You know, when these sailors were in town, uh, they did, I guess, as uh, sailors have done down through history. 
they've got a few uh, a few days in town, and so uh, often they were there. Also, to uh, lend to this, there there were temple prostitutes in the city uh, as well. So here are the two the two harbors. Uh, for example, uh, it's famous for its immorality. If you called a woman a Corinthian girl in, say, the Roman period, this was not a compliment. All right, this was not a compliment. Uh, also in the area was Ismithia, which uh, this is outside of Corinth, but this is where they would hold one of the Pan-Hellenic games. There were four Pan-Hellenic games. Uh, some of them were offered on four year, every four years. Some were offered every two years. So you would sort of build up to it. You would have basically a game uh, every year in a four-year cycle, if that makes sense. Some being offered every every other year. Some every four years. Uh, since Paul is here in Corinth for 18 months, uh, it seems likely uh, that he visited the Smithian games because he makes lots of references to, to gaming. By the way, here is a, a Roman toilet. These are the seats. There were no divisions between them, as we've mentioned, and this is the uh, area where the water would flow. Um, you put the stick in there. Well, anyway, we've already talked about that. The second missionary journey uh, we see... Uh, He's here for about 18 months, probably comes back at the third missionary journey as well. And, of course, he writes two epistles to the Corinthians. Um, he also writes several books from or letters from uh, Corinth, probably Romans and uh, First and Second Thessalonians. This has been excavated for many, many years, the uh, city of Corinth. Now, here is Corinth. There is Ismithia. You can see the uh, isthmus of that divides the two. And here's the Peloponnesus. So Paul has come this way here. He sailed over like this to this and to Thessalonica, then sails down to Athens, and then probably comes overland to Corinth. So here you see a close-up of it. You can see the two harbors of uh, ancient Corinth. You can see the modern canal. That canal, by the way, uh, wasn't built until the early 20th century um, by a French company. The Romans had tried to build a canal here, but failed. They gave up on it uh, after a short while. It was just too big of a job. And this, this canal has no locks in it. It's just a straight cut down through. Uh, anyway, here's Ismithia where the games were held. Here's Corinth and Acro-Corinth. Up here was the, the temple to Epaphrodite. It was up on top of this mountain. And so here is just a, a map showing you some of the remains of Ismithia. This was a, have a theater, a sanctuary, Poseidon. Poseidon was the patron god of this and the stadiums where they would run. So these, this would be used every other year for uh, major games. Pan-Hellenic means all the Greek uh, cities were invited. Here's some more of the ruins. I'll let you look at that. And an aerial view. Uh, there are lots of uh, events. Uh, I'll try to go through some of these uh, now. Uh, that took place in the Olympic uh, Pan-Hellenic Games, including the Olympic Games, the Games at Delphi, the Games at Ismithia, and so forth. Uh, boxing was there. Uh, as you might imagine, they didn't use big boxing gloves like we did. They just wrapped their hands with uh, leather straps. Uh, equestrian events, using horses like chariot racing and riding. The pan Cretan was a, uh, a, multiple, a fight of fighting sort of like boxing and wrestling. The pentath pentathlon uh, has the five events listed. Uh, discus, javelin, running, jumping, and wrestling. Uh, here's some ancient boxing. Uh, you see the boxers have their hands wrapped with these straps. Um, there are no rounds, so it's very different than our modern today. You would fight until somebody was knocked out or until they gave up. Uh, you could you could hit a, hit an opponent when they're down as well. That's, that's different than modern. You know, once a guy goes down, you got to back off. Not not so here. There were no weight classes either. So big guy, little guy. You know, the only division was by age between men and boys um, would be the difference. Opponents are chosen randomly, so you didn't know ahead of time who you would fight uh, by chance. And instead of gloves, they wrapped it with these uh, straps around their hands. Uh, this left the, uh, their fingers free. And of course they would use their fingers. Uh, they would poke guys eyes. You know, there, there weren't as many uh, rules like that as we have. 
There were four kinds of races as well, uh, mainly by length and sometimes by what you have. For example, a stadion, uh, a, which was sprint, uh, a stade, this is where we get our word stadium, is a stadium is uh, at least one stade long, which is 192 meters. Okay. Um, and a meter, of course, is 30, about 39 inches, so it's longer than a yard. Two stayed race, uh, then longer races between seven to 24 stades. Uh, they did also have, and, and typically all of these events were taken out, uh, you know, in what I call en natural. You, you were in your, as my mother would say, in your birthday suit. Um, but they did have a couple of events where they would wear the armor. Um, show their military prowess. So they had some races where you'd actually run with your armor. The armor could weigh 50 to 60 pounds. Wrestling, you must throw your opponent on the ground, uh, landing them on a hip, shoulder, or back for a fair fall. Three throws were necessary to win a match. There were very few rules, but biting was not allowed. Genital holds were not allowed. But you could break your opponent's fingers, for example. That was allowed. Uh, the pancreton. This is a combination of boxing and wrestling. <clears throat> uh, punches were allowed, but your hands weren't wrapped up with those straps, so you know it's going to hurt your hands uh, more. Of course, probably going to hurt your opponent more. No biting uh, and gouging of the eyes, nose, or mouth with the fingernails, but you could kick. Kicking in the stomach was a legal move. The Smithian Games uh, and the New Testament, and I'm not going to go through all of these scriptures with you, but you can look them up. Paul makes many allusions in his letters, and we find it in Acts and his letters to uh, competition, to running the race, uh, to receiving a prize, to receiving a crown. We also find it in the, the book of James and Revelation. So uh, these, I think, are undoubtedly references to these sort of Pan-Hellenic games to which uh, people in Roman culture would have been uh, very much attuned. And so I'm not going to read all of these to you. You'll have them. You can look them up, read them off of here, just for the sake of the time of this recording. But you can look at them yourself, and of course Hebrews as well. Uh, we're running the race. All right, here's the map of Corinth. And uh, just another one that shows us that area. The Temple to Apollo is the only thing the Romans left uh, standing in Corinth. Uh, built in the 6th century. It originally had 38 columns. This is all that's left now. Seven columns are left standing. These are monolithic columns of the Doric order. As you can see here, very simple uh, tops to the columns. And they're monolithic. That means one stone. The Roman Forum area of Corinth. Um, just some of the pictures there. Well, in Acts 18, then Paul's brought before the proconsul at Corinth, proconsul of Acacia, Gallio, Gallio, the proconsul. He is accused uh, by the Jews of inciting uh, trouble, uh, worshiping contrary to Jewish law. Uh, it's very likely this Bema, Bema was just a raised, it's a raised platform, and uh, it appears that Gallio uh, would appear there every so often to sort of hear court cases or troubles uh, and act as a judge. Gallio dismissed this case. If you uh, read it carefully, you'll see he dismissed the case because he said he was not going to get involved in Jewish disputes. I think this is a very important statement because it lets us know that officially the Romans had not distinguished Christianity from Judaism by this time that Paul is here because Gallio says this is a Jewish dispute. And of course the Jews are trying to be, make it very clear that this is something different. This is not just a Jewish dispute, to which I think they were correct. But this of course worked in Paul's favor in this case because the case was dismissed. And in fact, uh, the Jews end up beating up the leader of the synagogue uh, in front of the judgment seat, I think to perhaps gain some favor, I don't know, uh, with, with the judge to say, look, we don't want to cause troubles. But at any rate, uh, you can go through and read it that way. This gives us a good date for um, uh, any division of, and persecution of Christians as something different than Jews. Because you see, the Jews were, a Judaism was a legal religion. 
It was uh, religio uh, licita, means legal religion. Christianity, had not been associated with Judaism, would have been an illegal religion, religio illicita. Once it is divided that way, then it opens up Christianity for uh, open persecution by Roman government officials. So uh, from the forum, here we see uh, the Bema or the Rostrum. Uh, here's Acrocorinth up here. The Lecthian Way, the Corinth, and Acrocorinth. Acrocorinth had the, uh, I'll let you read some of this, but the Temple to Epaphrodite up here with a, a thousand cultic prostitutes. Uh, the activities of such uh, cultic priestesses, prostitutes, uh, you wouldn't have had to walk up here to find them. They would have come down here into the into the marketplace, but their temple was up here, and it's quite a hike to get up there. I've been up there a couple of times. Uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good hike. And there are medieval walls up here that you can walk around and see. But uh, nothing, uh, not much to see dating to the Roman period up here. And uh, this just gives you a view from up at the top, uh, probably where the temple once stood. Now, a um, uh, couple things that we should mention. One of the things I think I should mention, let me just go back to uh, Gallio, uh, if I can make my way back there quickly. Uh, when Paul is in front of Gallio, uh, there is an inscription uh, that mentions Gallio that's found at the city of Delphi. And, and this helps us a lot with the chronology of Paul because you would only be a proconsul for uh, a very short period of time, normally just a year. And uh, he is mentioned here. So this, this helps us with the chronology of Paul and actually mentions Gallio as the proconsul of Acacia. That inscription is in the museum at Delphi. And uh, I'll let you do some research on that. But Gallio is very important and the Gallio inscription. So I will move on. Uh, from that discussion. If you have questions about that, let me know. But I did want to mention it here because I'm not sure uh, if I mentioned it elsewhere. Another important inscription that's actually found at Corinth is the Erastus inscription. You can see it here. It's in the theater. You, you have to go looking for it. I remember the uh, first time I was at the site, I couldn't find it because it's not uh, normally a place where they take the tourists. This is uh, out of the general area even where you pay to get in. But important for us because actually in the stone is written Erastus. Erastus is mentioned in the biblical text as uh, he was an official, a dial. That means he's in charge of the finances of the city, very wealthy. It says this pavement was put in place with his, with his money. Uh, and so because of uh, Erastus, because of Gallio, uh, we can uh, pretty much date Paul's time here to the 56-57. Uh, AD, and that's very important for us to set the chronology of the New Testament. Uh, here you see Romans 16. Paul says that Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And uh, you can take a look at this inscription and more about it. Uh, do a lot of research. It's, it's actually uh, pretty fascinating to see it. There's also a synagogue inscription. No synagogue has been found intact, but this inscription was found, kind of a crude one. Uh, found along the Lecthian Way. This is one of the harbor roads uh, in the center of town leading out of town. Here's the inscription. I'll let you look at that. Uh, talking about the Hebrews here, you see, Hebron. Hebron. I have to reconstruct it. But, of course, Paul does preach at a synagogue there. Uh, this, would, this would date to much later than Paul, but it evidence that a Jewish community certainly was there in the 5th century and some menorahs. They found a stone with some menorahs which would also date to a later period. Here's a fountain uh, along the, the way just showing you some of the ruins of Corinth. And um, I'll let you look at those. And uh, Corinth was also a center of the worship of Asclepius. Asclepius was a deified, uh, became a god, a deified Greek physician. His symbol of this staff with the snake around it is uh, where the American Medical Association gets its view. The Asclepion was a healing center. This is a place where the ancients would go, the Romans, the Greeks, would go here for 
healing. And they would have they had an entire complex of uh, dining rooms, bathing facilities, uh, dormitories, theater, and other structures uh, that they had there. So here's some views of it. Now, <clears throat> the Asclepion was um, a place where people would come for healing. These are votive offerings. Basically, what you would do is you would make a model or buy a model, terracotta, pottery, of what was ailing you. So, here, arms, hands, feet, legs, so forth, are on display at the museum in Corinth. They were found near the Asclepion. So basically, you would leave this at the shrine, at the temple, ask for healing uh, for your, your foot or, or your, your head or whatever it was with these models. Um, so you can see the various body parts. I won't describe all of them, but I think if you look carefully, you will see a variety that are here. Okay. Well, uh, Sanreque, this is uh, one of the harbor towns, a port on the Saronic Gulf. It's on the Aegean, about uh, six, seven miles from Corinth. Paul sails from here um, at the end of his second missionary journey, and Paul commends Phoebe, who is from this town, in Romans 16. There have been some excavations here with some tombs, and uh, the harbor has sunk. So here you see some people out on the harbor walls where the warehouses would have been. Later, um, there was a church to Phoebe that was dedicated out here. And so then Paul sails across, and we know he goes to Ephesus. Here is the uh, aerial view, satellite view, that shows you Ephesus and the modern harbor of Kusadasi. So Paul would have sailed into here, into Ephesus. It had a river flowing from it, and now it's silted up, but there would have been a harbor. You could have sailed right into the city. Uh, right here. Here's Miletus. Here's Ephesus. Uh, this is the modern Kusadasi, the island of Samos. Uh, so here is the ancient harbor, the Caister River uh, that runs up here. At the end of the harbor there was a road that would lead you to a theater. Uh, from there uh, you could wind your way into the rest of the city. There were mountains, hills around the city. It's a beautiful place to visit if you get a chance to go to Ephesus. Uh, I'll be taking some people there soon, so if you are interested, let me know. Send me an email. I'd uh, love to have you go with me uh, to see this beautiful city. The city uh, history of Ephesus founded probably about 1500 uh, to 1000 B.C., so it's a very old history. Near today, the village of Selkuk and the Caister River. Ionians settled here. These are early Greek settlers. And then the Persians came and controlled it until the time of Alexander the Great um, in the 4th century. Um, famous harbor, and it was near the end of the Persian, the great royal road of Persia, which ran to Sardis, which is to the north. So an important trade uh, center, uh, important city, really, all the way around. Um, here we see, um, it famous, of course, for its temple uh, of Artemis, which is one of the wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world. When Alexander moves through, he leaves one of his generals there who dredges out the harbor. And this is, of course, something that would have to be done regularly. Um, and the fact that it wasn't done is now, if you go to Ephesus today, you, you have no evidence that the river was there, the harbor was there. It appears to be a pretty good distance from, uh, from the Mediterranean, the Aegean. Um, but that's what made the city uh, important. Roman control came around 65 BC with Pompey's uh, campaign to the east and uh, becomes the capital of the province of Asia under the Romans. It's destroyed in AD 17 uh, earthquake, destroyed the city, and uh, Emperor Tiberius had it reconstructed and enlarged. This is the Marble Way uh, through the city. Uh, and, of course, uh, early church connections here as well in Asia Minor, not only with Paul, but with the Apostle John, who uh, moves to this area and who becomes a, um, uh, a leader here. Um, it's from here that he will uh, write the Revelation, um, and a long tradition that Mary came with him as well.
after the resurrection. Remember, on the cross, Jesus asked John to basically take care of his mother. Justinian, uh, um, during his reign, the 6th century, is when the harbor silted up after uh, you know, they, they finally just abandoned it and the city went into ruins. Here is a large theater. Uh, Paul visits here. Uh, he, he writes an epistle to the, the Ephesians. Uh, the connection with John and Mary is certainly here. It's a leading Christian city. So here's the map. Here's the harbor. Uh, here's that theater I just showed you. And uh, this is the Marble Way. So normally as a tourist, you would you would come in around here by 37. You'd walk down through this way. Uh, you would turn a corner here. You'd visit the, li uh, the Library of Celsus and turn. Um, see some ruins here, see the theater come down, and then you'd normally exit pretty much out this way. Okay, so you'd make a, a walk through the city. Here is uh, the Harbor Way. Uh, the ancient shoreline was here. The harbor would have been here. It's all silted in this farmland. And this is a theater, large theater. Uh, you remember Paul uh, tries to enter the theater. And there's a riot, a near riot in the city. And uh, Paul is detained from entering uh, this large theater. Now, this theater was enlarged in the second century AD. Uh, so, you know, not, most of this does not date to the time of Paul, but the location certainly would have been the same place. And here's the way it looks the stage would have been here, uh, seating up here. Great acoustics in these theaters. Uh, as you head on down, you go by the Agora. The Library of Celsus is one of the main features. This is the Marble Road, and then you would turn and, and go upslope this way uh, to the Odeon. So let's take a look. The theater itself, uh, I'll let you read the details here, would seat probably about 24,000. Uh, and um, see, it's begun in the first century, completed in the second century. Um, Festival of Artemis, and have a procession all the way from the Temple of Artemis to the theater. She was the protectress of the city. And if you remember, uh, it was the silversmiths who were very upset with, with Paul, um, saying he was messing up their business. So um, that's what led, in part, to Demetrius standing up and working up the crowd. Okay, from uh, the theater... Uh, you can walk up the road, the street of the Cur Curiates, and this is the library of Celsus. So the theater's over here to the right. Uh, you would come up, if we were walking that way, we'd come up here and we'd come to this corner where the library of Celsus is. And then here's the road down to the harbor. Uh, the site of the uh, Artemis is away from that part of the city and kind of in a swampy area out here. There's nothing much left but this. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But not much to see today. I understand they're going to try to do some more excavation here and maybe change this into more of a tourist-friendly place. But a lot of times I've been here, it's been flooded with water. You have to walk on boards through here. Um, but it was a great temple in its day. One of the largest and greatest temples. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, over 400 feet long and over 200 feet wide with 127 columns. But just by comparison, this is about twice, more than twice the size of uh, the temple of the Parthenon. Pliny says it takes 120 years to build. It wasn't even finished at the time when Alexander the Great came to the city. He offered to pay to complete it, and the people said, it's not fitting that one god should build a temple for another. I think maybe this didn't want Alexander getting too comfortable in this city. Here's a reconstruction of it. It would have been huge huge, huge temple, just staggering. And of course, almost nothing of it's left today. A lot of excavations in this city, starting all the way back to the mid-19th century. Uh, a lot of uh, Austrians have dug here and continue to dig here. Excavations ongoing at Ephesus. It's a world-class site. Uh, here is uh, one of the column bases from the Temple to Artemis. And uh, here is the uh, Ephesian Artemis, is uh, really well known. Uh, for this unusual um, uh, depiction. Uh, many people think these are breasts. I've heard people describe them as being bees eggs. I've heard other people describe them as bull testicles. Um, I think most likely they're multiple breasts. And uh, the Ephesian Artemis looks very different than other 
Artemi, I guess we would say. Uh, but so very distinctive. But uh, the crowd's shouting, great is Artemis, goddess of the Ephesians. Uh, here is a, a fine, fine copy of, of an Ephesian Artemis right here. So you see the, uh, the small uh, deer uh, by her side. Here's a street in Ephesus, just to give you an idea what it looks like. The Library of Celsus here. And here it is again. This is built in 1 AD 135. Paul would not have seen this, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a large library. It was a facade. It was actually made sort of a, uh, an interesting way to get somebody buried in the city. You weren't supposed to bury anybody in the city. But a very rich man died. His son uh, was going to donate money to build a library. And then basically part of the deal was his father would be buried inside. So he was buried underneath. Back in here where, where all the books were kept, this was a second-story facade. There was no building behind it. Um, and so we can see uh, part of that history I just told you here. I'll let you uh, take a look at it. And here's the uh, reconstruction of what it looks like, would have looked like on the inside where all the books would have been uh, placed. The outside of the library, the library is just over here to the left, is this Gate of Augustus which leads to the marketplace or agora. Greek inscriptions found in the gate. Uh, and then there are terrace houses. Uh, these have been discovered uh, probably in the 1990s. They were excavated. And now you can visit them. And if you get a chance to visit them, I highly recommend it. This is where the wealthy people lived, up along the hillside, not far from the Library of Celsus. There are mosaic floors, as you can see. There are frescoes painted on the walls, and it's all under all under a um, protective roof now. And it just really gives you a, a real idea of how the wealthy people of Ephesus lived in the early second century. But uh, well worth uh, the extra admission it takes to get in there if you can do it. So here's their plan again. And so here is the theater, the Library of Celsus, and those terrace houses are over in this area here. There it is. And uh, that concludes uh, this discussion of uh, the second missionary journey of Paul.